welcome to Neurochino uh, on this Monday morning. Um, it was indeed an exciting week in science because we have a lot of papers today. Um, we're going to present about three by the looks of it, but I know there was a lot of papers floating in the background that we thought would deserve to be discussed in Neurochino. Um, and one more, fantastic. Um, Welcome. So you know the rules of the game. You present a paper, you share your screen, we discuss it to the best of our knowledge. Um, and you can ask all your questions and chances are if you don't understand something, someone else doesn't. So there is no wrong questions in that case. Um, right, Alexander, I suggest you start us off today because I took away your time last week. <laughs> um, so over to you. Okay. So my um, research paper is about robust myelination of uh, regenerated axons, including included by combined uh, manipulations of GPR17 protein and microglia. And this is rather fresh research. It hasn't even been officially published yet. It should come out next week, I guess, in Europe. And um, now in this um, research, we see that the function uh, deficit caused by CNS injury has been largely uh, attributed to se severing of long projecting ax axons. Um, despite tremendous progress towards developing strategies to promote axon regeneration, the behavioral and functional improvements achieved uh, with these methodologies are still limited and uh, even in um, experimental models. So we have this here, okay. <clears throat> now, in light of the role of the myelin in functional axon uh, conduction, these observations point to a need to uncover the, regulato uh, the regulatory mechanisms of myelination after CNS injury. For myelination in the adult CNS um, residential oligodendrocyte precursor cells, OPCs, pro proliferate and then undergo a poorly understood uh, multi-step differentiation process before ultimately becoming myelinated, myelination um, component oligodendrocytes. In most available um, demyelination models, remyelination occurs spontaneously, uh, preventing a precise examination of promyelination treatment that indicates de novo uh, myelination. So uh, in this study, the focus one was on finding out how OPC's proliferation and differentiation occur in injured optic nerves and how barriers obstructing uh, myelination of regeneration, regenerated axons can be overcome. The results um, related a set of translatable manipulations that enable uh, robust myelination, myelination of regenerated axons in the model. So in the study, the injury that was produced was about the, uh, just behind the retina on the optic uh, nerve cells in the model. And now I'm going to address shortly the methodology used in this um, experiments, which it's kind of a tricky and has a lot of multi dimensions, but I guess we can at least understand most of it. So um, mice were used in this uh, experiment about five different strains of mice. Um, experiments started when mice reached six to eight weeks old, and both male and female mice were randomized and assigned to different uh, treatment groups prior to injury. Quantifications uh, were examined blindly. A list of antibodies was used in the study that uh, triggered mice histobiology. For all surgical procedures, mice were anesthetized and received a post-operative analgesic. analgesic. Um, intravitreal AAV viruses injections were uh, performed two weeks before optic nerve crush injury to enable axon regeneration. Um, the optic nerve was exposed uh, and crushed with fine forceps for two seconds, approximately one millimeter behind the optic uh, disc. Afterwards, eye ointment was uh, applied post-operately uh, to pr protect the coronia. coronia. Um, robust axon regeneration could be observed two weeks post-crush. 
for different strains, uh, strains of mice, uh, different compounds were used, and most of them were focused on M1 and M3 muscarinic uh, receptor antagonists. So um, after perfusion, optic nerves were dissect, dissected out, samples were frozen, and then sectioned at 12 millimeter for optic, uh, from optic uh, nerve, nerves. So images were done with microscopes, electronic microscopes, and positive cell numbers uh, were then quantified manually using the uh, image software. Now about the statistical analysis and the quantifications. Normality and variance uh, similarity were measured by uh, Stata before the application of any parametric test. Two-tailed student's t-test was used for single comparison between two groups. Other data were analyzed using one-way or two-way ANOVA and uh, depending on the uh, ap appropriate design. Post hoc um, comparisons were carried out only when the primary measures show statistical significance. P-value of multiple comparisons was um, adjusted using Bonferroni correction. And mice with different liters, body weights, and sexes were randomized and assigned to different treatment groups, and no other specific randomization was used for animal uh, studies. Now, about the results, the first results that this um, study actually looked were to define um, injury-induced OPC proliferation. And to assess this, uh, in the study, it was administered um, bromodeoxyuridine. So at um, various time points after the injury and elevated BRDU, as they call it shortly, um, in corporation three hours post, post uh, injection with the uh, expectation to label different OPCs at uh, specific time points. The results revealed that injury-induced OPCs proliferation was increased significantly around three to five days after injury and subsequently reduced to basal levels at later time points, which uh, together results suggest that an optic nerve crush injury triggers repairs and reversible OPCs proliferation. Now, um, the other results are regarding the different differentiation failure of proliferated OPCs in injured optic nerves. And these are more specifically uh, to promote um, Excellent regeneration, streams of mice were injected with AAV expressing osteopontin into the various bodies, two weeks, vitreous bodies, two weeks uh, prior to optic nerve injury. Um, so, four weeks after the injury, 68% of the cells became CC1 plus oligodendrocytes, and about half of them exhibited um, cystoplasmatic oligo1 plus, which uh, the majority of these cells had short processes indicating of undifferentiated OPCs. The results suggest that uh, in injured optic nerves, OPC differentiation is suppressed. Data suggests also that uh, proliferated OPCs exhibit uh, differentiation blockages in nerves, uh, um, injured nerves that resembles what can be observed in the lesions of progressive multiple sclerosis patients. Now to the more specific parts of the research, which regards the protein synthesis of GPR-17. Let me just go there. Okay, here. So um, the GPR-17 protein. Previous studies uh, with cultured cells and experimental and, and autoimmune encephalomyelitis models identified a variety of compounds that could promote OPC proliferation or differentiation. However, in this unknown, uh, it is unknown whether any of these agents could, could facilitate myelination of uh, regenerated axons. To address this, in this study, uh, the scientists screened a set of small molecule compounds with the goal to identify those that could increase OPC's uh, differentiation in injured optic nerves. Uh, now, individual compounds capable of penetrating the blood barrier was administered systematically for four weeks after um, optic nerve injury 
in the mice, um, the pro differentiation effect of each compound was elevated four weeks, um, evaluated four weeks after administration. And uh, um, as shown in 2B and 2C, these uh, compounds significantly increased the numbers of BRDU uh, CC1 double positive cells, especially the Montel uh, Monteloxan, a GPR antagonist. So in, uh, either they, even though they found uh, different uh, receptors that were activated also, they were mostly focusing on the GPR17 uh, receptor antagonist. So as an antagonist of um, leuco triane uh, receptors, including GPR17, Montelukas is a clinically approved treatment for asthma and seasonal uh, allergies. GPR17 has been implicated previously as an inhibitor of oligodendrocyte differentiation. Further, um, furthermore, similar to Muntaloxan treatment, GPR17 knockout uh, facilitated the initial differentiation, but not late maturation of proliferite OPCs uh, in injured nerves. So the other very interesting um, discovery in this study is regarding the microglia, or more specifically, the, the differential effects of acutely or sustained uh, activated microglia on OPCs, proliferation, and maturation. Now, the researchers attempted to identify additional blockers uh, for the late maturation step of OPC differentiation. And an important hint was the dif uh, differing numbers of cells with cystoplasmatic olig-1 in injured versus controlled uninjured nerves, suggest, uh, suggesting a possible contribution of environmental factors. Because uh, neuroinflammation has uh, been shown to regulate OPCs proliferation and differentiation, it was further examined the role of microglia in injured optic nerves and uh, on OPCs proliferation and differentiation. Now, Mm, to examine the activation states of microglia in injured optic nerves, immunohistochemistry was performed with antibodies against um, I know I don't know some specific cells or antagonized one markers for M1 and M2 microglia subtypes. Um, so respectively, and uh, initiations of the different activations of microglia in acute and chronic conditions were observed. Unlike for GPR-17 uh, inhibition, the late uh, ablation of microglia preferentially, preferentially uh, promoted maturation of early differentiated OPCs into myelinating oligodendrocytes. So basically, they found out that myelination uh, rates were boosted significantly after removing immune cells microglia from the damaged nerve cells with, uh, with a drug called PLX3397. So to summarize so far, OPCs fail to uh, differentiate into mature uh, myelination component, oligodendrocytes, is caused by two reasons. Uh, the first is that uh, OPCs in injured nerves produce a protein known, known as GPR17, which blocks the first step of OPC differentiation into mature cells. Uh, second, inflammatory cells in the injured nerves interfere with another step of the OPC differentiation, which is later in the, uh, in the definition. Okay, so um, then the researchers took a further step of defining uh, combined treatments of um, Muntaloxant and PLX3397 uh, that will eventually lead to robust myelination of regenerated axons. So mice were treated with uh, Muntaloxant for four weeks from uh, day post injury uh, 1 to 28. And or uh, PLX3397, which blocks the microglia, uh, for two weeks during a day post injury 15 to 28. So after optic nerve injury crushing, the combined treatment dramatically increased the numbers of CC1 plus uh, cells. And the majority of these CC1 plus cells had a cystoplasmatic olig-1. Uh, implying that combinational treatment promoted early and late differentiation of OPCs. Similar results uh, were also obtained for immunohistochemistry with uh, antibodies. 
So considering uh, consistent with this, most of these cells exhibit extensive uh, elongating processes um, indicative of myelination. Uh, Mutelaxin uh, res restored myelin in about approximately 15% of treated uh, um, nerve cells. On the other hand, the microglia PLX uh, 3397 increased the remyelination in 21% of the uh, axons. In mice with the combined treatment, in majority, 60% of regenerated axons were myelinated. Many of these myelin structures were still seen and had uh, large tongues suggesting ongoing myelination. Importantly, the nodes of uh, Ranvier and some, sometimes semi nodes could be detected by electric uh, microscope or immunochemistry. So, um, these results provide important insights in general um, about re um, removing a major road uh, roadblock towards uh, rebuilding functionality, meaningful neuronal circuits. Um, importantly, the OPC's dynamics observed in injured optic nerves have remarkable similarities with lesions in patients with progressive MS. Furthermore, per, uh, persistently activated microglia dominated in injured optic nerves and in uh, MS lesions. So the results uh, reported here could be informative for designing myelination promoting interventions for progressive MS uh, and other conditions. These results highlight importance, the importance of the interaction between environmental and OPC uh, intrinsic mechanisms in uh, regard um, regulating the differentiation. Um, the results also suggest the binary role of the microglia in the OPC dynamics, although the majority of previous studies mainly emphasize the positive role of these activated microglia. Um, some studies as well showed that um, chemotherapy-induced persistent activation of uh, microglia contribute uh, to impairment of OPC differentiation. However, the molecular mechanisms underlying these uh, different activities of microglia are still unclear. Further um, studies will examine whether such treatments enhance behavioral improvements in injury models and other pathological conditions. So basically, I think that the clinical implications are really significant in the study in general. And um, the further studies should be promoted in this area because there is a huge promising results found. Okay, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is quite a rich paper. Um, would you, any chance you will be able to summarize it in one or two sentences? What's the, what's the really important take home message of the paper? The most important part is that um, the protein P, uh, PCR17 <laughs> Uh, is uh, one key uh, point of um, promoting or not promoting the uh, remyelinization of the injured axons. While on the other hand, uh, the contribution of the microglia in this study has shown that uh, it's, um, it has two phases. On the one hand, it has the, uh, in the early stages, it promotes the the differentiation of the OPC uh, um, cells, but later in the stages, after 15 days in this study, it showed that actually it uh, demotes the myelinization of the cells. So basically, they say that um, anti-inflammatory treatment that targets uh, microglia should be done in the post-injury uh, in CNS in order to promote remyelinization to be successful. That's in general. Wow. Are there any questions? Yes, Michelle, I can see you. Yes, I have a question. Thank you very much for this very comprehensive presentation. Um, and it is really interesting because uh, as far as I know it, you know, we don't really repair the human brain if you, if you damage it, you know, it's done. Um, and this is very promising. Uh, like my, my question, and I might have missed it, but I think in these papers, they really focus on to the biological aspect of recovery and what are the mechanisms to regrow the axons and have the myelin around it. And it looks like 
it's brand new and repaired but is it like really functional did it, i didn't see any measurement of whether you know those mice were able to to see again after like the regrowing or, or not actually the most uh, parts of the study were regarding the anatomical biological chemical uh, differentiation in the cells so basically i didn't find any evidence about the functional activity of those cells okay and 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 where like those connections sustainable uh, because uh, as you said like you know they convert you know, astrocytes and or an oligodendrocyte into neurons, mostly astrocyte if I remember well. Uh, but then, you know, you have a depletion of all the support that the astrocytes are doing locally. And if the neurons that are created are not fed, then, you know, they probably can die. And so it, 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 same thing, I kind of missed it. How sustainable was the result? They have longitudinal me measurements, but is it discussed? Do, do you remember? It's a complex question, but uh, you know. no, I don't think I found anything regarding this. I mean, uh, most of it was done. So after they they made some time point, a frame point. So they usually just applied it for that uh, time point, and then they um, observed uh, post mortem analysis of the nerves. I see. And I don't know how sustainable they would be, and also in a specific part, they suggest that. Um, it was observed that uh, myelination was actually ongoing and not, um, let's say, final. So basically, uh, there still there still haven't been any results regarding the final stages of myelination in these nerves. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, in the interest of time, I think we move on to the next paper, and I suggest we just go in order today because we have so many. And I've just seen that Michelle to sacrifice uh did sacrifice this morning coffee drinking water just to prepare a paper for us so uh let's move on to valerio okay um there you are. Yeah. okay so um i will talk about uh, this paper and uh, uh, the authors are uh, uh, this tomova and Sachs, and uh, so it, talk, it uh, talks about the effect of uh, acute social isolation so they, they made the participants um, isolate. Uh, so they couldn't have any social contact and uh, they couldn't uh, uh, use social media also. And then they looked at the effect of this uh, social isolation on the midbrain and uh, compared uh, this with the effect of uh, fasting, so food deprivation. And they show that uh, both uh, the univariate and multivariate uh, both signal uh, in the midbrain show similar signatures for uh, isolation and uh, fasting, while uh, there are some differences uh, in uh, other regions uh, like uh, striatum and other uh, cortical uh, areas. So uh, I think uh, this paper is very interesting because uh, I think it um, it is a common intuition that the feeling of uh, missing someone uh, is uh, similar to the feeling of uh, uh, hunger. And indeed, there is this uh, famous poem by Neruda that in which the author compares himself with a puma that is uh, hungry, but not for something to eat, but for uh, uh, um, his lover. And uh, so, um, and I think it is also very interesting uh, given this, uh, uh, that uh, we, all of us experienced uh, uh, more or less a period of social um, isolation during the lockdown. So I think it is uh, very interesting. And so this is uh, the design of the study. It is a uh, within uh, subject uh, design. So all participants underwent free scanning sessions. Uh, one after 10 hours of fasting, one after 10 hours of uh, social uh, uh, isolation and uh, one in uh, normal conditions. So in this uh, baseline condition, they also underwent a functional localizer task that uh, was aimed at uh, identifying uh, midbrain defined as those boxes that are uh, selected for uh, novelty. And uh, they measured the craving induced by the deprivation by in uh, two ways. So uh, one is the uh, is a questionnaire 
So uh, participants uh, filled a questionnaire in which they self-reported craving for either uh, food or social uh, interactions, and they did it uh, one time per hour during the deprivation. And furthermore, in the scanner, they underwent this uh, cue-induced craving task, in which they were showed images depicting social cues, food cues, or uh, flowers. And these pictures were, were also um, accompanied by verbal descriptions. And so uh, after uh, these, uh, after three pictures of each uh, category, they had to rate how much the, they created the category. Um, so our uh, first result is a um, manipulation check. So they report that uh, fasting uh, actually uh, increases uh, with, the, with time during the, um, the fasting, uh, increases the food craving as measured by the questioner. And also in the Q-induced craving in the scanner, uh, craving is much is significantly significant higher than uh, craving for craving for uh, social um, uh, interactions. And conversely, for uh, isolation, isolation increases with time the craving for uh, social interactions, and also in the Q-induced. Uh, uh, craving task. Here you can see that uh, um, social craving is much more uh, variable across uh, subjects in these uh, funny plots. And uh, then uh, these are the univariate um, analysis in the uh, functionally defined uh, ROI, the response uh, to uh, social cues response. Mm -hmm. So the, the response uh, to social cues is uh, higher during isolation than uh, during fasting. And uh, conversely, the response to food is higher after fasting than after isolation. However, uh, th uh, this is a bit um, surprising because if we compared the response to food after fasting to the response uh, to food uh, in a baseline uh, condition, there is no significant difference. Uh, and uh, the same also for um, social cues. Instead, what happens is that uh, uh, isolation reduces the response to food cues. And uh, so you can see here, and so uh, this means that uh, uh, deprivation reduces the response to cues of the non-deprived need rather than enhancing its, uh, the response to its cues. Uh, then they also looked at uh, multivariate uh, pattern analysis and they used both uh, uh, decoding and uh, representational similarity analysis. So the decoding approach consisted in uh, training a linear classifier to distinguish the um, pattern of activity in response to, uh, to food versus the pattern of activity in response to control cues using the data from the fasting day. Then uh, this uh, classifier um, was, the user to, was used to distinguish uh, between social cues and control cues on the isolation day. And they show that the classifier actually generalizes. And this result suggests that the pattern uh, of response to food after fasting and to social cues after isolation are similar. Um, uh, so like in, in the midbrain, the midbrain respond to a cue for a uh, the private need, no matter of the of which need um, it is. However, um, the classifier also generalizes uh, for food against a flower in baseline condition. So actually, uh, some information about the queue identity is uh, retained. And for this reason, I think that uh, this approach is not uh, really suited to address uh, the, this question because it, uh, it doesn't allow to know whether 
uh, our uh, crucial variable, so whether the need is deprived or not, is truly represented in an abstract form in the midbrain. And instead, I think they should have uh, used this uh, CCGP, that is a cross-condition generalization performance that has been uh, used, for example, by Bernardi and Fusi. And uh, so it uh, systematically tests all possible generalizations. And so it allows to really characterize the geometry of the representation. Uh, instead, to better um, tackle the question, they used the representational similarity analysis and they show that uh, uh, social cues after isolation are more similar to food cues after fasting uh, than uh, uh, food cues at, at uh, baseline. So the deprivation make the two patterns uh, more similar. Uh, still, I think this is not a really um, good uh, way to approach uh, the issue. I think it would be better to um, uh, use uh, a partial regression. So to use uh, the um, representational similarity models as uh, regressors, and then uh, to uh, estimate how much each uh, representational similarity model um, explain the neural similarity. Uh, so in this case, the representational similarity models will be Q identity uh, and uh, deprivation. And uh, so it uh, would allow to disentangle the two effects and to show which is um, significant in the brain. Uh, then they used the univariate uh, signal to look in the striatum. And uh, uh, they report that in the striatum, there is a dissociation between uh, uh, signature of isolation and signature of uh, fasting. Indeed, uh, here you can see that uh, um, there is signature of fasting in uh, nucleus accumbens and putamen. And instead, there is a signature of uh, isolation only in uh, caudate. Uh, also, there is a dissociation in um, other uh, brain areas. So um, isolation uh, increases uh, the response to social cues in orbitofrontal cortex, and uh, um, while fasting increases uh, response to food cues in amygdala, insula, and uh, anterior cingulate uh, cortex. Uh, so I, um, these are the most important uh, results. Uh, and now I, I want to point out some points that I think are uh, more uh, interesting. So first of all, uh, this paper is uh, done in an, uh, yeah, was uh, pre-registered uh, through open science. Uh, uh, and so um, I think it is very interesting because although it, of course it reports many interesting uh, results, but also some results that were not expected and that there are uh, non results. So for example, uh, there are uh, differences in the, um, uh, in the effect or in the um, uh, results if we use uh, rho i defined anatomically or uh, functionally. And, and also there are differences in the measures uh, they use of, to characterize uh, craving. So I, so I think it is interesting in that um, it, um, it showed that uh, it, it is not that always we obtain very clean results. So I think it's interesting. Uh, uh, for Artermore, they used a functional uh, localizer. And uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, Sachs is a, uh, uh, the, is uh, one of the authors of this uh, paper, and uh, she also uh, wrote uh, this uh, article with Kangusher, uh, and uh, they uh, they championed the, the idea of uh, functional localizer as a way to uh, increase the uh, power of the analysis, because um, they allow to don't uh, uh, correct for multiple comparisons across all voxels, as we have to do in uh, whole brain uh, analysis. And uh, at the same time, it, uh, it uh, 
uh, solve the the, um, uh, the double dipping uh, problem. So you we test the data. Uh, we test different data. Then we use to select the row i. So it is very powerful. I think it is uh, very interesting. Another uh, interesting point is that uh, uh, the deprivation reduces the response to other needs rather than inducing the enhancement of uh, the response. To it. So, like uh, isolation reduces the response of midbrain to food cues rather than increasing the response of midbrain to social cues. Um, and I think it is very interesting also for um, study of addiction because um, I couldn't uh, find the, the reference, but uh, I, I have read that uh, uh, in addiction, there is uh, this problem that uh, everything uh, else, uh, uh, the people lose interest in other uh, things. So it is not only that uh, you crave for something, but that also other things are uh, less important and less valuable. So I think this uh, may relate to this. Uh, then uh, another uh, result was that orbitofrontal cortex responds to social cues after isolation, but not to food cues after fasting. And so there is uh, some uh, specificity in orbitofrontal cortex uh, response. And uh, this result is uh, at odds with this uh, uh, perspective about uh, orbitofrontal cortex. It is, uh, for, for example, uh, um, proposed by Stalnaker and Schoenbaum, that orbitofrontal cortex, like uh, they uh, cr uh, criticize uh, this uh, perspective on orbitofrontal cortex that uh, uh, it is involved in um, many specific uh, uh, functions. And they argue it is not uh, involved in many specific functions, but it has a broad uh, involvement. But here we, we see a, a <clears throat> Uh, selection between uh, uh, isolation and fasting. So I don't know. I think it uh, uh, it, it prompts uh, many other um, uh, investigations. Then another interesting point I think uh, is that it uh, these uh, results uh, highlight that we uh, as people are um, uh, we have uh, these uh, needings like uh, like in the teams. So we need uh, food, uh, we need uh, safety, and we also need uh, uh, social interactions. And uh, and these uh, almost, uh, these uh, needs uh, that uh, amounts to maintaining a certain almost, um, uh, is used to evaluate experience. This is a uh, uh, so these results, I think uh, they do detail very well with uh, the proposals by Damasio and Edelman that uh, uh, experience in uh, and, uh, acti and patterns of activity in uh, also prefrontal cortex is actually evaluated by structures that are low and primitive, like uh, midbrain. And I think it also relates to, to um, a proposal by Thomas Hills. Um, that uh, he proposes that uh, we evolved, we evolved uh, um, mechanisms and uh, um, specifically dopaminergic uh, circuits to um, foraging, so to uh, re regulate uh, the search of food. And these mechanisms, mechanisms were then uh, co-opted and um, um, actually used to uh, uh, regulate the search for any kind of resource. So in this case, uh, uh, some other people, and so other people can also be a resource like food. Uh, uh, at, at first glance, because uh, maybe contact with other people leads to food itself. So it, it is uh, like a proxy. But uh, then, uh, uh, it's like, uh, uh, according to this proposal by Thomas Hills, we, these uh, uh, dopaminergic circuits became to uh, regulate any um, search for any resource. So, um, and lastly, I think also uh, it uh, relates to this uh, experiment by Ash. So in which, uh, I don't know if you know it, it's, uh, 
this uh, conformity bias. So people tend to uh, change uh, their uh, perceptual uh, judgment to conform to uh, the group uh, they are within. And then there are also some experiments which uh, look at the neural correlates of this effort. And the striking gate, they um, find also striatum like um, they do. Although they uh, observe it in nucleus accumbens, which uh, in this uh, study was not associated with the isolation, but with fasting. And so I think it is very interesting in uh, showing uh, what happens in our brain when we are uh, isolated. And uh, I think uh, an interesting point to address further is uh, how this uh, isolation then uh, influence our um, decision making and our uh, social cognition, for example, maybe uh, it would uh, increase uh, partisanry. Um, I don't know, but I think it is uh, very interesting. And last, uh, last point, I think it, uh, uh, this study is uh, also relevant for uh, uh, this idea that uh, metaphors are um, grounded in the body. So in the experience, in sensory motor experience. And indeed, in this paper by Gibbs of the 2004, uh, they also um, cited uh, that uh, poem by Neruda and as an example of how um, desire and um, needing of, of, for other people is uh, um, uh, understood in terms of uh, hunger. And so this uh, metaphor that is uh, desire is hunger is present in uh, every language and they also report uh, uh, results about English and Portuguese, about uh, how this uh, metaphor is uh, uh, readily understood by people. And so what they say is that uh, um, we understand that we uh, desire as um, uh, hunger uh, because uh, they, according to their um, idea, metaphor is this, is uh, uh, explaining one domain with a more uh, uh, primitive one. So desire that is more complex is explained, is uh, understood uh, by a, a sense of motor experience that is hunger. And, but I, I think, but I, I don't know, I think it, it also, it could also be that uh, instead uh, the experiences of uh, hunger and uh, of missing someone as are uh, more abstract, so they are in the brain, they are, uh, maybe they are exactly the same. So the source of this metaphor is uh, uh, even more, um, um, I don't know. <laughs> okay, I have finished. Lovely, thank you. That was a very nice overview and a very timely uh, paper, it seems. Um, just before I give questions to the floor, um, I may have missed it in the beginning, but why did they specifically look at the midbrain? Ah, okay, because uh, uh, the midbrain uh, uh, is uh, known to uh, um, be associated with the craving and uh, because uh, it uh, contains uh, uh, dopaminergic uh, neurons. And uh, these uh, dopaminergic neurons are uh, known to fire in response to uh, when as associated to craving. And uh, so this uh, all uh, after, uh, in the case of drug addiction, but also in case of uh, fasting. And for example, there is this uh, result of um, uh, that uh, in uh, mice, Loneliness also <clears throat> induces uh, response in the midbrain. So it is a very um, reasonable guess that the midbrain um, uh, respond to isolation. Thank you. Are there any questions in the room? Yes, Valentina. Hi, I wanted to ask uh, why the initial hypothesis was that fasting relates to um, social isolation. Maybe I missed the point, I, I didn't understand. And uh, if uh, this uh, 
initial hypothesis could have biased them in uh, their result. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so the, this hypothesis uh, stems from uh, um, uh, uh, this idea that uh, uh, these uh, dopamine, dopaminergic uh, circuits control uh, craving. And so the idea is that there is uh, an uh, analogy between uh, craving for uh, social uh, interactions and craving uh, for food. So this uh, analogy is uh, the source of the hypothesis. Uh, of course, it, it could have been, it could have biased the, the, um, uh, the, the analysis, but uh, what I think is uh, uh, interesting is that they use this uh, pre-registration. So all the, um, all the tests, all the statistical analysis were, uh, 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 this were registered before. So they, they before uh, uh, making uh, the experiment, they said, uh, we want to do this, this and this. And so this uh, really atten um, reduces the uh, risk. The experimenters are, uh, are biasing uh, the results because of course, uh, bias can happen uh, because there are many uh, degree of freedom you know, when uh, conducting uh, an experiment and there are many tests you could perform and so even uh, uh, without uh, um, actually wanting to fishing for uh, p-value as a, uh, without uh, actually wanting to bias uh, the results it can happen but I think a registration is uh, a useful way to avoid this and uh, indeed they also show some uh, results so yes this is lovely thank you uh, we got about 10 minutes left so michelle i'm sorry i have to push you to next week and leah you got sorry <laughs> 10 minutes for you leah okay so uh in this paper uh, they study um internet rounds of the mouse visual cortex um, and they use uh, the uh, patch sequencing uh, techniques that allow you to have uh, uh, morphology, electrophysiology, and uh, transcriptome informations at uh, a single neuronal level. This is what uh, uh, catch my attention because uh, uh, I'm not familiar with these techniques, but the results are really uh, beautiful. So I want to share with you these uh, uh, images. And um, so they try to use this uh, uh, multimodal uh, way to characterize uh, these ne neurons. That, uh, and uh, they define this new type called MET, that is uh, M for morphology, electrophysiology, and transcriptome. And they try to see if there was like a pattern in this uh, data that they uh, collect and uh, um, finally they found some interesting um, stratification of data um, also basing of the uh, levels, the layer specific exon uh, in the region patterns. Um, uh, and this is uh, their schematical uh, graphical abstract. They actually analyzed uh, 4,200 uh, GABAergic interneurons. And in uh, a subgroup they, uh, of 500, they study morphology. So I try to look in these uh, patch sequencing techniques and uh, uh, so they like broke the uh, membrane and they can uh, measure like electrophysiology, uh, like potentials. And then like using a different uh, pressure, they extract the neurons. And so they can study the morphology and also the uh, transcriptome use the complementary DNA, DNA RNA uh, sequencing. Uh, I'm not really, um, I never done this analysis, but uh, they had a lot of uh, results and uh, interesting findings. So, um, and again, uh, the uh, um, data flow that they used, they also uh, mapping the um, neuron sequencing in the 
uh, mouse Hallen Atlas that uh, allow you to um, give like a localization of the different transcriptomes. They use a different uh, um, way uh, of embedding uh, you, to explain the, uh, the variety uh, of uh, the data that they were measured, like view map, but also principal component. So they really uh, find to uh, try to find a, a pattern in the data. And um, here you uh, you can see like the colors are uh, according to the different uh, transcriptomes. Uh, usually you have this hierarchical structure here. Uh, they try to plot in the in uh, using UMAP in a low dimensional space. Um, and uh, then going fast, um, they uh, try to do the same also with uh, the electrophysiology information and try to see if also here there, were, there, there was some clustering of the data. Also for the morphology, I think this is the most beautiful image where they try to characterize like uh, uh, five different uh, patterns of the morphology, um, the neurons morphology. And uh, so they measure the soma and merge the dendrites and axon lengths. And uh, they see if there was a correlation with the transcriptomes and actually the correlation were quite high. And uh, then uh, they see that there was like a redundancy. So sometimes like to, um, a, a morphology structure, there was like correspondence of more uh, transcriptome types. So they uh, found to, uh, they tried to uh, merge like morphology, electrophysiology information, and see if there was uh, a correlation with the transcriptomes. Actually, uh, you can see there is a clear certification, but sometimes there is also a redundancy. So they try again to cluster about the met type. So uh, putting together all these informations, and here you have the links if you have the same. Uh, Morphology, electrophysiology type, uh, type but different uh, T type and vice versa. They try to predict, uh, starting from some information like uh, electrophysiology and morphology, to predict the transcriptome. So they try to put together these different informations dealing with all these uh, uh, problems that you can have. And uh, um, at the end, they also find uh, 13. Uh, different met type basing of um, on some information of these neurons, also like the um, uh, the genetic information, these SST type. Also, there were other um, specific or at least of neurons. Here, I was lost a little bit, but the um, uh, take home message is like putting together these uh, uh, three different uh, uh, measures can uh, um, give you like a, a new insights of uh, how classify neurons. Here you can see that there is like uh, in these neurons that you can think that they are all the same because I don't know, they are there. They, but actually they um, have um, like a lot of uh, variations. And uh, so then, yes, they say that combining these methods uh, will facilitate the development of high resolution cell type specific circuit maps. So uh, this was uh, like the uh, take home message. So a new way to uh, explain uh, uh, these uh, different characteristics. If you have uh, time, I will pass. Thank you, Leah. You Beautiful, I guess. Sorry. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, uh, this is my um, favorite one. I really like it. I, I have to admit, I might need more time to actually fully understand it, but it's, it's a new new way of looking at the anatomy. It's quite, quite pretty. Uh, Michel. Thank you, Leah. It's great. Okay. So, uh, so if I understand well, they use UMAP to identify different category of neurons. Um, but I was wondering if they you know, in the meta, does it explain how much variance is explained in the two-dimensional representation of the neurons? Yeah, actually, the UMAP at the beginning was like um, an exploration of the data. Uh, so their main findings are not uh, um, 
according to the EU map, map uh, mapping, it, it was just to uh, see uh, different distributions and uh, actually if like they're going on with this analysis, if there was like good possibility to find uh, a data structure. So because uh, the correlation that they did after they was uh, using the uh, sparse uh, principal component data score of the electrophysiology. Uh, so, uh, and um, it, it was like to represent also here, they use, they try to map. So it was like a way to look at, um, into the data and see if there was, uh, I see. Uh, so it, what, what I understood, because also there is a long so, supplementary so experience. So they started with a U map and then they did a principal component analysis. Yes, to characterize. Um, here also to, and then like to the major. That's very fam where... that's very familiar as an approach. <laughs> uh, if I understood uh, the... well, because also then they, they use like a super vector machine to predict and to see if there was they use like a, everything that you can use to look in, into this data because uh, yes uh, I think that was in transcriptomes you have a lot of information and uh, they also did correlate yes that's great thank you are there any other questions I have one yeah go for it um do you uh, do they say that if they plan to explore exactly uh what are their different clusters? What, why do they see exactly these clusters of neurons of, I mean, of, um, well, the, they make clusters of, of, uh, of neurons with different, uh, um, with their uh, particularities. And uh, do they say if they will explore exactly why they see this kind of behavior when why they well try to explain their data basically or they are they just saying okay we've got a lot of data and we've put them together and that's it uh no there was like an i an hypothesis uh, behind that so i think that like the morphology um uh, electro electrophysiology and transcriptomes are um, something really characteristic for neurons uh, and they expect actually like uh, 64 different types but they find uh, uh, 28 and uh, so they say that there will there could be like uh, some noise uh, in the uh, measures uh, uh, for example when you do the electrophysiology you are not sure to uh, recording just one neurons but you have noise nearby so there could be some problems. And then like here um, at the end, they really uh, comment the results using these SST characterization or uh, other information where the, um, that they know, uh, like lamp five uh, of neurons, all these uh, information that you know that the neurons can be characterized in these subclasses. Um, actually I'm not really familiar but with this, but they really discussed everything uh, using this uh, uh, prior knowledge that they have about the neurons. And um, also they say that uh, the clustering that they found were also um, like close to some specific genetic uh, informations that uh, they have that they know uh, about these neurons. So if I answered, they, they really comment the, uh, the results basing of all this knowledge that they have. Uh, but here, I think they try to uh, merge these uh, uh, measures that you can have use patch sequencing uh, with, all, with other knowledge that you have um, about neurons, if I answered. Okay, yeah, thank you. Right, I can't see anyone else having a question. So thank you very much, Leah. Thanks to everyone else who presented today. And we hope you have an exciting week in science and we see you next week. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.